So have a think for a moment about some of the things you and I are most likely relying upon or expecting will happen tomorrow. That the sun will come up, that the sun will go down, that you'll still have your job, that you'll be living in a war-free country, that you'll have food on the table, that you'll have your health, that you'll be able to see, hear, touch, taste and smell, or that you'll wake up. Now, consider another question then. Can you be absolutely 100% certain that those things are going to happen, any of them? Of course not. But it'd be probably true to say that all of us are planning our lives with the strong expectation that those things will happen, correct? But isn't it interesting that we can presume so much about certain future events that in reality we have no real certainty of because we don't know the future, yet when it comes to the promises of God who does know the future and his will for our lives, we can so easily doubt if he's actually going to do what he says and wonder at times, if we're honest, whether his ways and his will are really the most beneficial options for us. And this kind of thinking is revealed whenever we rely too much upon our own presumptions about the future more than God's ways, God's word and God's sovereignty in our lives. Well, that is what this passage in James chapter 4 deals with as it teaches us the importance of making plans that are in line with God's will for our lives and also what it means to rest in his sovereignty rather than purely doing what we think is best and living with a presumption that everything we have planned to happen will actually happen. Now, to put some context to this passage, James wrote this epistle to Messianic Jews, Jews that had come to believe in Jesus as the Messiah and who therefore now refer to themselves as Christians. And because of their new association with Christ, these Jewish believers suffered a great deal of persecution from their own countrymen and the result of this that they ended up being scattered all over the place. This then led to many of them compromising, becoming quite worldly in their conduct to avoid further persecution. And so it's primarily that problem that James sought to address by writing this letter. It's a very direct, yet a very practical letter. And as those of you know who have studied or read it before, one resounding theme above all others in the book of James is the subject of faith. Faith in trials, faith in temptations, saving faith, works of faith, faith to control our tongues, faith to pray, faith to obey the word. It's all about faith. And in these five verses in chapter five, James, sorry, chapter four, James specifically deals with faith as it relates to our future plans. So looking at the text again, verse 13 it says, come now you who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So in verses 13 and 14 here, James outlines the problem he was needing to address. And from what we read, we can see there was obviously a widespread and it would appear influential attitude among many believers of self-centered presumption with regard to future plans. Self-centered presumption with regard to future plans. And that's essentially what the issue was. And it would appear that this attitude was coming predominantly from among the unbelieving Jews and it was now having an effect upon the believing Jews. So rather than having an attitude that recognized God as the ultimate authority and seeing themselves as available to go and do whatever God called them to do, too many believers were just living for earthly goals that revolved around their own selfish plans and desires. And it's clear from what we read here, the goals and aspirations of these believers were very material in nature and fueled by a desire to make money, to succeed in business. Listen again to what they were saying. Today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. And what stands out here more than anything else is the strength of their presumption about these things, presuming they would even have tomorrow presuming they would get to a certain city, presuming they would be in the city for a year, presuming they would trade in business and presuming it would all go well and result in them making a profit. So many presumptions, and as we'll see, the things they were presuming upon were not actually sinful things in and of themselves. That wasn't the issue. 
The issue was that they were making plans independently of the Lord and of his will for their lives. They were following their own ways, and by doing so, they were completely disregarding God's ways. They were living for a temporal purpose rather than for an eternal purpose. Now, obviously, James had other information that led him to write this letter. And whatever information he had gave him good reason to assume these believers were not thinking about planning or living their lives in light of eternity with spiritual priorities, but instead were living their lives focused only on earthly priorities. And when a, perf- a person who professes Christ lives in this manner consistently, it means one or two things. Either they are a false convert, having never really embraced the Lordship of Christ when they profess to believe in him, or they're compromising as a believer, losing sight of the fact that our lives are not just about us and our own plans and our own goals, but our lives are to be living sacrifices, well-pleasing to God, constantly conforming to his plans and purposes. It makes no sense for us as believers to invest our lives only in this life, giving the majority of our time, energy, effort, affection, attention and resources in such a way that only really affects and enhances this short period of time that we will exist on earth that we call a lifetime. Not when as believers that entire span of time is nothing but a speck in contrast to the rest of our eternal eternal existence. Look at verse 14 again. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And the point he makes is clear. He's saying you're living in such a way that indicates you do know what will happen tomorrow. But the fact is you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Only God knows. And you're acting like your life is the entirety of your existence. But the fact is, it's a vapor compared to eternity. And the word used for vapor here can also be translated as mist. It speaks of something so short lasting, so temporary, something that is here and gone in an instant. Now, some of you remember that a month ago I used this verse as a cross reference. And when I did, I gave you a an analogy by means of a prop, which I have again today because it makes the point. I'm not normally a props person, as I've said, only on Christmas Eve and special occasions. And this is a spray. This is just water in here. No one's going to get ill or anything. And I want to do this because it's just more, it does more than words. When you go, that's it. That's our life in, in light of eternity. Even if you live for 120 years, Compared to eternity, all it is, is that. That's it. And so if we heed the words of James, which are really the words of God, it should cause us to think long and hard about how we spend our days, how we make our plans, and what our expectations are for the future. As Moses said in Psalm 90, verse 12, So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What about your life? This is a good time to think about this. Are you living like it's just a vapor, just a mist? What are you primarily investing your time, effort and energy into? Do you desire the wisdom of God who knows all things to be guiding and directing your plans and decisions? Are you thinking about life on this earth in more of a puffed up and elevated way than you should? Remember, it's just a mist. Are we trying to make that mist as great as we can and so focused on that mist and neglectful of what's beyond? The great thing is what we do with that little mist of time can have great impact for all of eternity, if done in faith according to the will of the Lord. That's the point here. So in verses 13 and 14, James defines what is certainly a wrong perspective for a believer to have. And he also explains why it is a wrong perspective. And again, let's be mindful of the context. The Jewish believers were facing heavy persecution for their faith in Christ. Some of them were devoting their attention to new adventures, plans to do well in business, to not be quite so radical in the way they lived their lives. As a result of this, there would be the additional bonus of escaping some of the persecution that had been coming their way, allowing them to slip under the radar a little. How might this relate to some of us, perhaps? Well, I would say it's true to say some of us at times 
may find ourselves making future plans a little bit independent of God. And as were the believers in James's day, would it be true to say that sometimes if we do this, it's to take ourselves into greener pastures, perhaps an easier life away from our current situation, and in some cases, a life that's a little less noticeable, a little less radical, and a bit more acceptable to the unbelievers in our lives. There is the temptation to do that increasing in the times that we are living, to not stand out so much. Now, this doesn't apply to all of us, as it says in verse 13, only you who say these kind of things. If the shoe fits, we should wear it, but there's no need to take on unnecessary guilt. And so if you are, by God's grace, seeking to make your plans in light of his will for your life and in light of God's priorities, be encouraged. James is not talking to you at this point. Now, some of us might be more goal orientated or ambitious than others. We like to have a schedule, a strategy or a big project on the go to achieve a desired end. And again, this is not a problem as long as it's surrendered to and influenced by the Lord. But there should be red flags if those things are carried out independently from the Lord. Why? Because he knows best. And the bottom line is this. We should all be holding very lightly, very lightly to our expectations of the future. Yes, we need to plan. Yes, we need to make certain presumptions. But if we hold too tightly to our expectations or too presumptuously to our plans, when life takes an unexpected twist or turn, we'll be plunged into doubt, insecurity and despair because we've not learned to rest upon the sovereignty of God. Proverbs 16.9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Alternatively, when we make our plans, including the Lord, surrendering to him with the willingness to be flexible, it gives us confidence and security even when things seem to be falling apart all around us. Our confidence is in knowing him, not knowing the future. That's where your confidence should be, knowing him, not knowing your future. And one of the great dynamics of the book of James is the way he diagnoses and exposes the underlying heart attitudes. And he does this so there can be healing and restoration. We need to be open to this in our life also. Again, it wasn't the plans themselves in verse 13 that were sinful. The problem was they were self-centered. They were independent. And James was burdened for these believers, desiring for them to experience the blessing of God upon their lives. But he knew it wasn't possible. As long as they were living to please themselves and attempting to short circuit the will of God for their lives. As you are looking at the year ahead, there'll be things you're planning, anticipating, presuming upon. We all have expectations. And may I encourage you, if you haven't already done this, to consider how much the Lord is involved in those things. How much the things you're going to invest your lives in are lined up with God's priorities for your life. A great prayer for us all to pray in light of these things is straight from Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, where David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. That can be a prayer that we pray, and it's a prayer that God will answer. Maybe you have the confidence that you are seeking to please the Lord in the things you're planning and working towards. If that's the case, again, hold lightly to those things, recognizing his sovereignty over all things and all situations. Okay, children, the first point of view on your sheets this morning is this. Christians should be living for the purpose of pleasing God more than themselves and for eternity more than this world. This can sound strange, kids, sometimes. You mean please someone else more than me? Yes. When we please God more than ourselves, it's better for us. And though you can't see eternity, children, remember that little mist is your life too. And there's a whole life beyond that that God has for us, that we can influence and sow towards. <clears throat> now, as we get to verse 15 now, we'll be encouraged to do this very thing as James outlines the right perspective for a believer 
and what it is that makes the right perspective. Verse 15, he says, instead, so in contrast to the wrong perspective in the previous verse, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So it's clear here in verse 15, the things these believers were planning to do, again, were not wrong. It was a fact there was no consideration of the Lord in these plans, no recognition of his ultimate authority and his sovereignty. That's what made it wrong. As followers of Christ, all of our plans, again, should be filtered through the will of God as revealed in his word. And that which is not specifically addressed in the word should be brought to the Lord in prayer. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. You have muddled thoughts about the future? The Bible says, pray about it. Tell God. Keep telling God and your thoughts will be established. Look to the word of God and your thoughts will be shaped and settled. Now, when necessary, with more significant plans and decisions that affect more people than just ourselves, it is also wise to seek counsel from others. Proverbs 15.22 says, Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. People don't seek counsel when they want to do their own thing, but when they are sensitive to the will of the Lord, <coughs> they seek counsel. And the word awry there means to fall apart or break. And it's true that our plans are a lot more fragile, more prone to fail when not made with godly counsel. Now, with regard to the phrase, if the Lord wills, James is not saying that the most important thing is that we actually say those words out loud. It's a bit like when we say pray in Jesus name. The point is that we pray in Jesus name, not that we say the words in Jesus name, because you can pray in Jesus name and not be praying in Jesus name. Because it's a position of the heart. But it's good that we can say that. Same with if the Lord wills. We can say if the Lord wills and it sounds very spiritual and we don't actually mean if the Lord wills at all. Or we cannot specifically say those words but we have an attitude of the heart that is flexible to the will of God and yielded. So it's good to say those words when necessary and that's why it's a common phrase among Christians during conversation to qualify certain statements we make with our future plans by saying, if the Lord wills or Lord willing. I think our family um, wore out that phrase at the beginning of this year when we were praying about our plans and, and had no idea that we'd still be here and are very thankful that we are. But every time somebody said more of an absolute statement like, oh, you're doing this, we would always say, well, if the Lord wills, we don't know. We're just we're open to what he has for us. Paul knew and lived out this principle in Acts 18, 21. He says, I will return again to you, God willing. In 1 Corinthians 4, 19, but I'll come to you shortly if the Lord wills. 1 Corinthians 16, 7, I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. It speaks of surrender. It speaks of a yieldedness. And the point is, it's both good to plan and make sure those plans are yielded to the will and wisdom of God. It is a completely wrong extreme to think, well, I'm really spiritual. I don't make any plans because God's got everything in control. God tells us to make plans, but they need to be yielded to him. Let me put it this way. If our plan A is God's plan B, then we need to hold lightly so that when he changes our plan A to his plan B, we can accept the fact that our plan B needs to become God's plan A and therefore our plan A also. Does that make sense? That's basically the sum of what we're talking about. You might need to rewind that and slow it down. The correct perspective that James is encouraging here is to acknowledge God in all your plans. We know we can't hide from God. We can't make plans and, and then cover this little part of the paper. I don't want God to see that one. It's kind of a cheeky one there. As if God's saying, oh, I can't see that. We should move your hand. <laughs> we need to accept the sovereignty of God in all circumstances. God doesn't have a day off. God never looks down at your life and goes, whoa, oh, oh, sorry, I was doing something else. That wasn't supposed to happen. He never does that. Now, we have to be careful that we don't try and use the sovereignty of God as an excuse for unpleasant circumstances that are nothing more than consequences of our bad or sinful choices. 
because God uses those to teach us lessons. God is sovereign over all things, but he's not responsible for sin, nor is he the author of sin. But in his sovereignty, he'll work his plan out perfectly through the mess that we may have created, but we are still responsible for the mess. So we need to be careful in the way we think about God's sovereignty as it relates to our circumstances. We can't just walk into willful sin and there's a mess before us and say, well, God's sovereign. He's, he's over all things. He allowed it to happen. It's just part of his world being worked out. I'm just a puppet. Not true at all. You're responsible. There are consequences. But you haven't caught God by surprise. Now, in verses 13 and 14 of James chapter 1, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Can't blame God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by what? His own desires and enticed. That's what Satan capitalizes on. That's why temptation is strong, because it's capitalizing on your sinful weaknesses, my sinful weaknesses. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a temptation. And a little further down in chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good Gift And every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. There is no dark side to God, in other words. So we can't blame him for the consequences of our sinful choices, but we can be thankful that God is merciful. And when there is repentance, when we've turned from that sin, he's more than capable and willing to restore us and lead us in the way everlasting, as we saw in the prayer in Psalm 139. So the most, most important thing to grasp then is to be sure to make God central in all our thinking, in all our planning, in all our doing as we navigate through life. So here's a, a point from what we've been looking at so far then to make, and that's this. Any self-focused plans that seek to bypass the will of God will have no eternal value whatsoever. This is good biblical advice to have lingering in our minds as we go into a new year. Any self-focused plans that seek to bypass the will of God will have no eternal value whatsoever. That's not a good way for any of us to live. You might think, oh, I was going to join the local golf club because that's not spiritual. I shouldn't do that now. That's not what that means. But if doing that is going to knock other priorities out of your life that are clearly revealed in the word of God, then maybe that is something to reconsider. Or how you do that. As a dear old saint once said to me, don't ask the Lord to walk with you. Ask the Lord if you can walk with him. There's a difference. We don't know what will happen tomorrow. We don't know the future, but God does. And that's why it makes sense to trust him. And to be extra thankful and perhaps to humble ourselves before the goodness and greatness of God, knowing that even the things that we presume upon that will happen tomorrow are gifts from God and evidences, evidences of his grace. Our next breath will only happen because the Lord wills. Our next heartbeat will only occur because the Lord wills. And so it makes perfect sense to have the attitude that whatever plans or decisions we make for our tomorrows will only come to pass if the Lord wills wills and that's the safest place on the planet to be in the lord's will now if we're honest some of the time when we find ourselves seeking to avoid the will of god or at least trying to bargain with god for a more watered down or compatible version of it it's because we fear surrender but we don't need to fear surrender to god and we don't need to fear surrender to God anywhere near as much as we need to fear rebellion towards the will of God. And that's what we can do. I fear surrender to God, so I will, what? Rebel. In Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13, we read the following. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will and to do and read those words for his good pleasure we learn two important things from the last three words in that verse firstly as God works in us as God leads us as he influences us and shapes us he does so for his good pleasure not our own for his good pleasure Secondly, we learn that in light of God's character and his merciful, loving nature towards us, this means that whatever his will is, 
ultimately is going to be the best for us anyway. The things that give God pleasure are things that are good, right, holy, and pure. So his will will always be better than anything we can come up with as an alternative. Even if that involves a degree of trials and suffering, we really need to grasp this. His will will always be better than anything we can come up with as an alternative, even if that involves a degree of trials and suffering. There is no security outside of the will of God. So as you go into this new year, doesn't it make sense to go into it knowing that you're in his will? I want to give you a few very simple and very practical questions that you can ask yourself. And there is an outline in the bulletin. I should have said there's a few spares if you want one out in the foyer. A few very simple and practical questions that you can ask yourself with regard to making your plans. And they are as follows. Number one, have I submitted my plans to God first? Are there significant things that we've just added in that are going to take up a lot of time and energy and resource and effort and attention and affection that we've not really even prayed about or thought much? We just want to do it. So it's down on the calendar first. Are they in harmony with the word? Have I prayed about these things? Have I sought counsel? Secondly, will I continue to submit my plans to God? Will I keep praying about them? Will I be open to the Lord's will above my own? Just because we might make a decision to do a certain thing or go down a certain path in January, that doesn't mean it's the Lord's will for us in February. But if we're in, in a relationship with him, if we're regularly in the word and in prayer and around believers, there should be that sense of flexibility and direction. Number three, am I willing to stop, go or change direction if the Lord is leading me to? In other words, can I let go of my expectations and my own desires and agenda? And be very, very wary of the phrase, the Lord is leading me when that's just a person's own idea that seems to go contrary to biblical counsel because all that does is pushes people away to say, well, God's spoken. You don't need to. Thanks. I'm fine. But the Lord verifies his will through the witness and the counsel of others. Number four, if things don't turn out how I expected, Am I willing to take responsibility where appropriate and accept this as God's sovereign will for my life? Can I be content in his will for his glory? Sometimes we, we struggle because we feel like our plans have not worked out. Things have not turned out how we expected them to, but we fail to stop and consider but maybe they turned out exactly how God intended them to. Maybe it was his will all along. And you see where you can rest in the sovereignty of God. And one of the things that I try to remind myself of often, which really helps for me to keep God central in my thinking when making plans or decisions, is a simple truth that I am not my own. And I need to remind myself of that every day. I'm not my own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, it's actually a good thing that we are not our own, that we don't belong to ourselves, because if we did, we'd probably mess things up a lot more than we do currently. And knowing that we're not our own should help us to yield our plans and decisions to the Lord's will. What's the point of trying to live and act as though we didn't belong to him? So whilst it's true that, as we said before, any self-focused plans that seek to bypass the will of God will have no eternal value, it's also true to say that any God-focused plans that are in the will of God will have eternal value. And again, that's another piece of biblical advice that's good to have in our thinking as we go into the next year. Any God-focused plans that are in the will of God will have eternal value. The Lord wants us to be prepared for eternity and he wants us to be at peace with uncertainty. 
That's what we can have as Christians. We realize that, right? We can have complete peace with complete uncertainty. He wants us to be like little children who are totally dependent upon their father, looking to him for guidance, direction, comfort, and help. Imagine if upon arriving at a busy shopping mall, a two-year-old child asked their mother if they could make their own way around. And the mother said yes. How would that turn out? <laughs> and that's what it's like when we think our way is better than God's. But thankfully, he loves us and he knows what it takes to keep us close to him and dependent upon him. Children, there's a second point for you on your sheets, and it is this. It's good for us to remember that in anything we plan to do, we need to be willing for God to change our plans according to what he thinks is best. You know, children, that time where maybe your dad or your mum has said you're going to go and do something fun, and then, you know what, we're going to have to do something else. Oh, you said we were going to go and do that fun thing. I know, but this is happening. We have to change your plans, be flexible. Well, God does that in our life sometimes for a good reason. And we must be flexible to change according to what God thinks is best. Now, as we look at verse 16 next, we see that not only were these believers making plans independently of God, they were boasting about it too. Verse 16, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. James was a pretty straight shooter and he wasn't pretty. So it's one thing to presume upon tomorrow, but it's another thing to boast about those plans, which is really like saying, here are my plans and God can't do anything to stop them. James uses very strong language saying that this type of boasting is not just arrogant, it's evil. And if you think about it, how can it be anything else? When a person boasts about their plans and make their plans independently of God, it's not too dissimilar to the way that Satan operates. God has his way, Satan is going to go the opposite way. God has his plan, Satan's going to try and usurp it with his plan. So to a believer, this would be a very sober warning, if nothing else, showing us that we would be more in line with the will of Satan than the will of God when we march independently ahead of God, and especially when we boast about it. Imagine the two-year-old boasting about the day they're going to have at the shopping mall left to their own devices. It will be ridiculous. And the essence of evil is doing things my way instead of God's. And at a foundational level, this all stems from pride. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And then verse 25 of Proverbs 16. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's a problem when we take a way that seems right, but it isn't right. Again, it's okay to plan. It's okay to schedule, it's okay to strategize, but we must make God central and we must get our planning permission from him before we build things into our lives. Again, some relevant words from the book of Proverbs 27 verse 1. Do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring forth. So it very clearly, doesn't it? Doesn't mean you can't talk about tomorrow. Just don't boast about it in such a way that's saying, no matter what. Now, from a practical perspective, of course, this doesn't mean we have to wait to hear from God on every little decision we make. Should I have cornflakes or Weepix? Lord, I don't know. It doesn't mean that. We seek wisdom in the word with what is already revealed to us about the will of God. And we move forward being flexible to be led in different directions as we pray and make our decisions and as we seek counsel for others. That's a safe way to live. When we continually renew our minds through the reading of the word, it allows God to shape our thinking and to place his desires within our hearts and minds. I encourage you to decide how you're going to read the Bible in 2020. I put those one version of a plan out there. I sent an email out earlier this week with a bunch of different ones. But please, as a believer... As you go into this new year, don't just start by waking up and saying, mm, where shall I read today? Because it's just going to make it harder for you. Decide ahead of time whether you're going to read through a year or two years, whatever. That's not the point. The point is that you are in the word consistently because you're saying, I'm not my own. 
He is my authority. I need to hear from my authority. I need to yield to my authority. And guess what? He's an authority who loves you, who died for you, who's got good plans for you. And we'll find then that often our choices are his will for our lives because we're living in close union with him. It's very characteristic of God to put his desires in our hearts when we're seeking his will. That's why I love Psalm 37 verses 4 and 5 that says, Delight yourself also in the Lord. And that, you can say, occurs as you spend time in the word and in prayer. You're delighting in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Verse 5, Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Delight in him. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Remember what Augustine said, and I've quoted this many times. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. Then do whatever you want. Because if you're doing that, you'll be led by the Lord. When you treasure the Lord and his word within your heart, he leads and directs you. We remain sensitive to his lead and we are safe moving forward in the wisest way we know how. So let's finish this morning by looking at verse 17, where it says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So because God has given us his word, we really don't have any excuse when it comes to knowing his will. There have been times when I have known of something God has spoken clearly in his word that should lead me in a certain direction, but I've deliberately ignored it, gone ahead with my own plans. And when I've done this, it is the sin of omission. It wasn't what I did that was wrong as much as what I didn't do that was right. To him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And I've said this many times before, but the majority of blunders and failings in my own life when I've neglected God's commands, sinned against him and his word, have never occurred because of a lack of information. It wasn't that I didn't know what to do, I just didn't do what I knew what to do. So with more knowledge comes more accountability. But as we seek to turn that knowledge into wisdom by walking in faith, trusting in the word of God and the God of the word more than ourselves, we stay on the narrow path. We experience the blessings of God. Children, your third point and final point this morning is this. It's foolish for us not to do what God has told us in his word because he always knows best. And kids, if there's one thing to take home from this morning, it's this. He always knows best. God always, 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 always knows best. So it's a bit like this. Try to follow me here. As we abide in his word and seek him with our whole heart, we grow in faith. And as we exercise that faith, even at times through difficult circumstances, we see the results as God is true to his word. This then draws us deeper into relationship with him and deeper into his word and causes our faith to deepen and allows us to face greater challenges and situations. Then as we exercise that faith, trusting in the good character of God, we see the results and we are again drawn deeper into that beautiful relationship we have with our creator through Christ. And on and on it goes until we get to glory. That's God's desire for us. To delight in him through his word to increase our faith in the word, to trust him and step out by faith, to see him act according to his word, to draw close to him, to delight ourselves in him. It goes on and on. It'd be true to say this. If we expect nothing else other than the Lord's will to be fulfilled, we will not easily be disappointed with the unexpected events of life. If we expect nothing else than the Lord's will to be fulfilled, Fulfilled, will not easily be disappointed with the unexpected events of life. And we will know joy and peace as we walk in obedience, even through trials, even through tests, even through tribulation. Now I want to finish by reading a scripture in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. We call this our family's life verse. I'm sure it is for many. It's such a perfect summary to all that we've looked at in this text. It's almost like a an exposition in itself of the text. Verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
This speaks of the focus of our heart as we look to the Lord in total dependence, to trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. So this is not relying upon our wisdom or ability to try and figure things out and second guess everything and want to see steps two to ten when God's only shown step one. Verse six, in all your ways acknowledge him. And this speaks of making God central to our plans through prayer. And he shall direct your paths. Now this is the result of having this attitude towards our plans and decisions giving us the promise that God will overrule even our bad choices. And he will lead us in his will if we're walking in dependence upon him and his word. So I hope that as we have spent time in these five verses from James chapter 4 that you feel better equipped, hopefully encouraged as you look to the new year. I hope you are thoroughly convinced that God's ways are always better than our own that his plans are always better for our lives than our plans, and it's always best to follow in all situations his will all of the time. Just to close, I want to read an excerpt from a poem. I'm not normally a poem reader within my sermons. How about that? You've got a prop and a poem in one sermon. That may never happen again. <laughs> but every now and again, a certain poem seems relevant and therefore gets my attention. This is quite well known. Some of you may have heard it before. It's called Only One Life. It was written by the famous missionary C.T. Studd. And I'm just going to read a very small portion at the end. If you like the sound of it, you can Google it and read the rest in your own time. And the last two um, verses of this poem say, Two little lines I heard one day, travelling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one, soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. May that thought linger with us throughout the week as we enter this new year and make our plans that only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your goodness and your grace. And Lord, we would ask that you grant the wisdom that you promised to give as we plan, as we look ahead, even as we reassess some of the things we may already have planned, Lord. Give us the courage and the humility to do this. Put us around those who we can seek godly counsel from. And I pray for each one of us, Lord, that there will be no reason to end up in a place of deep regret and wishing that things had been done differently because we went ahead independently. And Father, for any of us who at this point are maybe feeling the sting of choices we made in this past year where we did go independently or where we have suffered the consequences, I thank you for your grace and your forgiveness that is abundant and your mercy. I thank you that you can restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And I pray, Lord, that above all things you be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.